Energy Symposium, sponsored by the Energy Institute. Um, next week's uh, talk will be uh, an attack of the postdoctoral fellow again. So we'll have Justin Ritchie from the University of British Columbia. He's a postdoctoral fellow there. Uh, he is going to talk to us about uh, IPCC scenarios and how some of their assumptions affect the outcomes of that scenario, including uh, what their assumptions are about, say, the oil and gas resources and how this plays out in terms of the uh, types of results, if you will, that we see from, uh, from the report. So we'll kind of have a macro scale look at uh, decarbonizing or low carbon analyses uh, to follow today's talk. So it's our pleasure to welcome Jesse Jenkins, uh, recently graduated from MIT Engineering Systems uh, with his PhD, and now he is a postdoctoral fellow at the Kennedy School, and he is one of the environmental fellows uh, at the Harvard Kennedy School, so one of six, is that right? So excellent job, Jesse. Um, so he's focused on a lot of analysis regarding uh, energy systems integration, uh, including what's going to be his talk today on decarbonizing the grid, simulating electronic uh, or electricity grid dispatch, unit commitment modeling, but he's interested in distributed en energy resources. Uh, he's studied different disciplines to try to get a cons comprehensive view of our energy system, including operations research and optimization and uh, engineering principles. So uh, with that introduction, uh, we'll hand it off. So uh, thank you, Jesse. Thank you Thanks for coming. Thanks very much. And Thank you. And thanks to UT for having me today. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be in Austin and to uh, share my research with all of you today. Um, I'm going to talk about the challenge of eliminating carbon emissions in the electricity sector. Um, and given that this has been in the, uh, the political discourse lately due to the um, uh, debate around the proposal for a Green New Deal, uh, I thought we'd talk a little bit about that proposal um, and how the electricity decarbonization challenge fits in uh, to the efforts to um, repower our economy with low carbon resources. So uh, I titled this talk, Getting to Zero, uh, Zero Emissions in the Electricity Sector. And I just wanted to just take, take the sort of big view as to why, uh, why zero. Uh, why is it not enough to, say, reduce emissions 80% in the electricity sector or 50%, um, which, as I'll show you later, are much easier challenges for a variety of reasons than getting all the way to zero. Well, this graph, um, which is from a paper by Glenn Peters et al., that looks at the pathways that we would need to take as a global economy to be on track to meet the goals that the international community committed to at the Paris Climate Accords, uh, which was to try to limit global warming, average global warming, to less than 2 degrees Celsius, and if at all possible, uh, less than that, ideally to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So this uh, shows uh, a number of modeling scenarios. Uh, the different colors represent the year in which stringent policy effort begins and emissions start to fall globally. Um, and uh, and the, the individual lines are a variety of simulations with. Uh, global integrated assessment models, and then the, the, the solid lines are the sort of average or representative scenarios for each of those policy pathways. And what you can see is that in terms of global carbon intensity of energy, which is the amount of CO2 emissions produced per unit of economic activity, GDP, or any other measure, uh, all have to fall to zero, really regardless of when we really start to take the climate challenge seriously. Um, and indeed, fall to less than zero or become net negative by the later half of the 20th century if we want to stay on track to two degrees of average global warming. If we take the 1.5 degrees Celsius target seriously, which the IPCC recently outlined um, in detail in a recent special report that came out in 2018, this is what the pathways look like for global net CO2 emissions. So the previous one was rates. This is absolute tons of CO2. But you see the same thing, which is that emissions have to essentially fall to zero here by around mid-century rather than the second uh, half of the century. Um, and in a variety of scenarios, depending on how much we can count on net negative emissions from uh, sources that pull CO2 out of the atmosphere and sequester it permanently, um, you have different trajectories here uh, with different degrees of uh, net negative emissions and overshoot in the near term. So in every case, global emissions of all sources have to fall to zero. The electricity sector itself plays an important role in all of those scenarios, and I would argue is the linchpin in any of our strategies to decarbonize the overall economy. And that's for two reasons. One, it's about a third of emissions, uh, at least in the United States, and a large, uh, one of the largest chunks globally. Um, so there's no way we're going to get to zero emissions unless we eliminate uh, that ch uh, chunk of the overall emissions challenge. But even more importantly than its overall share of global emissions, all of the scenarios that you can find to decarbonize the global economy rely on an expanded role for electricity in decarbonizing other sectors of economic activity like transportation, industry, or heating, um, which are currently powered by fossil fuels and which low carbon substitutes are much more challenging or expensive to find than in the electricity sector. 
So we have twin challenges, drive emissions basically to zero in the electricity sector and expand uh, the supply, overall supply of electricity from low carbon sources to help decarbonize other sectors. So what you find over and over again in these scenarios, and this is a graph showing the clean energy share or low carbon share in the US as part of the mid-century strategy report that the Obama White House put out in 2016, finds that the power sector has to cut emissions furthest and fastest of any sector of the economy if we're gonna reach zero emissions overall. So the good news is that wind, solar, and battery energy storage, which are key components of any kind of strategy to decarbonize the electricity sector, have gotten much cheaper over the last decade. This graph shows the average levelized cost of electricity or the average uh, uh, cost revenue that a, a wind so or solar facility needs to earn per megawatt hour of generation that they provide in order to cover all their costs. And the cost uh, per kilowatt hour of the battery packs themselves in a lithium ion system just over the last decade. And what we see is that the cost declines are really remarkable. Um, basically 70% for wind, 75% for solar, and 85% for lithium ion battery packs in a decade. That has really fundamentally transformed the set of options that we have available. And I think fundamentally transformed the political landscape uh, to the point where now where we've got, you know, uh, wind and solar facilities that might cost five cents per kilowatt hour or $50 a megawatt hour, where they used to cost well over $100 just a decade ago. So that really changes what we think can be politically possible in terms of the cost of decarbonization, and I would argue is largely responsible for the surge in discussion around something as bold and grand as something like a Green New Deal. The idea that we could repower and transform our entire economy to run on clean energy sources simply wasn't uh, wouldn't pass the laugh test a decade ago when these prices were this high, but now that energy from wind and solar and batteries to complement them has become so cheap, we can now perhaps begin to be, uh, begin a conversation about how to decarbonize the overall economy um, and, and what that might look like. If you look globally at the pace of wind, solar, and biomass, uh, the other key renewable resource development, uh, the black line here shows the rate of global increase in energy uh, production, primary energy production from these sources, and uh, mapped against the different trajectories from the tracking the Paris Agreements paper that I talked about earlier. What you can see is that wind and solar and biomass are really on track so far. Now I say so far because there's a knee in this curve, right? They're exponentially increasing in many cases or nonlinear increasing. And so if we wanna stay on track, we have to continue to accelerate the rate of deployment for solar and wind. We can't simply continue at the current rate. Um, and the bad news is that uh, the rest of the mix is not tracking where we need to go. So nuclear and carbon capture and storage feature prominently in all of the global scenarios for deep decarbonization that have been published so far. And if you look at the range of, uh, of scenarios in these modeled reports versus the trajectory that we're on now, we're simply not keeping pace. So global deployment of new nuclear power plants is effectively offsetting retirement of, uh, of older power plants in the West that are now retiring due to age or economic challenges. And we're essentially treading water in terms of global supply of nuclear energy. Uh, carbon capture and storage is sort of stuck at the starting line with major improvements in the technology through demonstration projects, but no real global scale deployment of any kind, um, particularly not at anywhere near the scale that some of these scenarios envision. Um, this very large uptake uh, is due to the uh, prominence of the negative emissions technologies role later on in the scenario, which all rely on carbon capture um, to take uh, either biomass sources uh, and, and burn them and capture the CO2, or to take carbon directly out of the atmosphere to help reduce emissions. So we've got part of the clean energy team moving forward and then the other part basically stuck at the starting line or treading water. So if that's the case, should we go all in and commit to the resources that appear to have the tailwinds behind them, wind, solar, and storage? Uh, why would we try to struggle to, to overcome the challenges facing the deployment of nuclear or carbon capture uh, or the sometimes overlooked renewables like geothermal energy uh, or large scale hydropower? Indeed, that's exactly what several hundred grassroots environmental uh, groups and social justice groups urged Congress to do in an open letter that was submitted uh, to the House leadership uh, in January, where they called for a rapid transition to power generation to 100% renewable energy uh, in it, uh, by 2030. In addition to um, excluding fossil fuels, they wrote, any definition of renewable energy should also include, exclude all combustion-based power generation, nuclear, biomass energy, large-scale hydro, and waste-to-energy technologies. So if you ax all those off the list and you read between the lines, what this really says is what we want is wind and solar power. These technologies are, in their view, at least environmentally benign. They're relatively affordable. They're scaling rapidly. Why should we pick anything else that carries different trade-offs with them, like the air pollution implications of biomass or the nuclear waste uh, management challenges of nuclear power? Well, I authored an op-ed in the New York Times shortly thereafter as sort of somewhat of a rebuttal to this, um, this, this view that we really should only invest in solar and wind. 
arguing that we need a much more diverse set of resources to cost-effectively and reliably decarbonize the global grid, including in particular resources like nuclear, geothermal, fossil fuel power plants with carbon capture that offer what I'll describe later as firm low carbon capacity uh, that we need to complement weather-dependent variable renewables like wind and solar. But let's pause for a minute and talk then about why, if wind and solar are the cheapest forms, not just of low carbon energy, but in many cases of any electricity source available to us, why we wouldn't simply invest in wind and solar. Uh, why not put all of our chips behind these technologies? Well, the mental model that would argue for doing so, um, and that would argue for the policy support that solar and wind have seen in the past is this one, which is that what we're, the challenge we have globally is for solar and wind to come down in price enough so that they are cheaper than new fossil fuel construction, right, for new natural gas or coal-fired power plants. And if they become cheaper than coal or gas, then at that point the market should take off and adopt these technologies as the preferred investment. Uh, and we really don't need too much more from public policy to drive the transition to clean energy. So the challenge then was to take this early period when solar here, and I could map uh, wind and it follows really the same kind of trajectory, when solar was much more expensive than coal or gas um, and capacity deployed was very low, use public policy to bridge that gap and encourage investment in solar or wind through things like tax credits or mandates for uh, solar or wind adoption by utilities. And as we scale up the global deployment of solar, we drive things like experience curves, learning by doing, economies of scale in manufacturing, and incremental innovation that drive down the cost of these technologies. And there's a really strong relationship between global cumulative deployment of wind or solar and the cost declines that we've seen in their levelized cost. So drive that thing forward, get the cost to cross over, and let the market take over. It was sort of the mental model behind a lot of the policy support for these technologies. A mental model I had myself as I advocated for energy policy at an organization called the Breakthrough Institute, where I ran the energy and climate program for four years. And luckily, we've achieved this crossover point, at least for new construction of, wind or, uh, of gas or, uh, or coal. Um, uh, kicking offline existing coal or gas plants with amortized capital costs is much more challenging, um, but we're actually getting pretty close to that as well. So solar and wind are now so much, so much cheaper than anything else that they've crossed over the, this, this point and have beaten fossil fuels on cost in a growing uh, share of the world. So what's wrong with that mental model? Well, I liken it to comparing the cost of a banana to a burger when deciding what you want to eat. Right, it's good to know that the banana is cheaper than the burger. That's useful information. But it's probably not all you need to know to decide what you want to eat for dinner. Right? The banana is not a perfect substitute for a burger. Right? They both offer you calories, but very different types. Right? Different nutrition, uh, different you know, uh, personal value or utility or enjoyment from eating them. And of course, it, it, it doesn't matter. It isn't just whether you want a banana or a burger. It's what else do you eat in your diet. Right? If you only eat burgers, your doctor is going to yell at you. Same probably if you only eat bananas. So what you want, of course, is a balanced diet of different amounts of nutrition from different sources. Uh, and the same is true for a balanced energy system, right? And that's what we'll see in the modeling results that I'll show you. And so comparing these two things and saying, well, one is cheaper than the other is useful, but it is incomplete information, OK? A coal plant is as different from a, a solar farm as a banana is from a burger, right? So what we really need to be thinking about is the value of each of these individual technologies within a portfolio, a specific energy mix at a specific time, and a specific deployment level, because they change over time. And so the challenge isn't actually for solar or wind to get cheaper than coal or gas. It's for cost declines for solar and wind to outpace their declining marginal value as you deploy more and more of them in the system. And they drive down the energy prices that they're earning at the times when they generate. Um, which we see in a variety of studies um, and in our own modeling work. So this uh, graph summarizes uh, three different studies, um, uh, of Germany, California, and uh, I think this is Texas, actually, from the MIT Future of Solar study. They looked at what happened to the value or the revenues that solar earns as you deploy more and more of it into the market. So this is the value uh, earned per average megawatt hour, so the um, number that has to be higher than your levelized cost for you to make money. Uh, and this is the market share in terms of the annual energy generated in that electricity system by solar. So as you deploy more and more of it, you see a steady decline in the value uh, or revenues that the solar facilities earn. Uh, and I've plotted on top of this the average 2018 levelized cost from Lazard for large-scale utility solar. What you can see is that we have a cost of fallen enough that we can get solar to maybe 10 to 20 or 25 percent of the energy mix before its value falls below its cost. Okay, but beyond that, we would need to see additional uh, cost reductions for solar to see uh, additional deployment make sense. Um, and so the race is on, not between solar and fossil fuel costs, but between declining cost of solar and wind and their own declining value in the energy market. 
There's a similar declining value for energy storage. So even though batteries are getting cheaper and cheaper, just one moment, um, we're also seeing, uh, uh, we also would see a decline in the value of storage as we deploy more of it. And that's because storage is primarily an energy arbitrage, um, which means that uh, you're moving, you're buying low and selling high with a storage device. Um, and as you buy more at the time when prices are low, prices get higher. And as you sell more at times when prices are high, prices fall. And so eventually that price spread declines and you no longer get enough value from the storage facility to warrant further deployment. So if you see the same kind of thing, this is from a 2016 paper that I, I, I published on the, the role of or the value of energy storage. And we see this basically linear decline as a function of power capacity deployed in this case rather than energy. Okay. Um, so I th think we'll hold questions to the, the end or do you have a oh, clarifying question? I'm going to explain that in the next slide, so perfect question. <laughs> yeah, so let's dive, dig into this. What's behind this value decline? Because this is really important to try to understand and unpack if we want to think about the role of different resources in the overall system. So I identify three mechanisms that are primary mechanisms that drive the value decline for wind and solar. They're different for batteries. I'll focus here on the energy supply sources. So the first is a decline in the fuel saving value or energy substitution value of wind and solar. That is to say that for every megawatt hour of energy that a wind or solar facility produces, it's going to displace the, the, a megawatt hour from something else. And that something else burns fuel usually, a natural gas plant or a coal plant. And so there's a value to that, that's saving the fuel or variable cost of the facility that is displaced um, by that megawatt hour. And we'll see, as I'll show you, that value declines as we deploy more and more uh, solar and, and wind into the system and start displacing the more expensive plants uh, and eating into the, the supply curve so we end up uh, displacing less and less valuable resources over time. The second is a decrease in the capacity value or the substitution of a single megawatt of a resource like solar or wind for a megawatt of something more reliable like a natural gas-fired power plant. Um, and at high penetration levels, that capacity value falls to close to zero for solar and wind. And the third is an increase in overgeneration, which is that the energy generated by wind and solar is all correlated to the same time, right? When it's sunny or it's very windy. And you might get a lot more of it than you need in certain hours as you deploy more and more wind and solar, even when the average share is relatively low. So you might have seen a lot of, uh, um, if you follow the sort of clean tech news, you might see frequent headlines about how Sol uh, Germany or southern, uh, 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 southern Australia or California surpassed some record for the most energy produced by solar or wind in a given hour. They've reached 30% of energy share or 50% of energy share or even 100% in certain hours. Those are all seen as exciting progress, um, but the challenge is that their average energy shares are much lower than that, right? So in, in, uh, in Germany, it's about 10% from solar, maybe getting up closer to 15, and they're bumping up against this limit that now we have periods where we're generating more than we need. Um, and as I'll show you, that means we either need to uh, curtail that output, which isn't paid for, um, depending on the contract structures it can be, but generally in a system that curtailed energy is wasted, there's no value to it. And the second is we can store it, and storage has a cost, right? So we have to start adding in then the cost of storage to capture the overgeneration and use it at another time. There are other factors uh, that are typically called integration costs um, in the utility sector. Uh, things like the increased flexibility of other generators that are needed to pair with wind or solar, uh, the, ramping, uh, uh, the ramping up and down of thermal power plants and the cost that that imposes on them in terms of operation and maintenance, uh, the need for more uh, transmission expansion. And these are important and real costs, but they tend to be second order effects to the order of magnitude type changes in value that you can see due to the first three factors. So thinking about wind at very high penetration or solar at very high penetration gets dominated by these kinds of factors, uh, the first three. So let's look at an example of this. This is a spreadsheet model I developed. It's not the detailed research model we use, which I'll show you results on from in a moment. But let's just think of a simple example. We only have four options for meeting our electricity mix. We have wind uh, and solar, which is a little bit cheaper, uh, very expensive nuclear, and a pretty affordable natural gas plant, but it, it emits CO2. Okay. And this is using weather data uh, and load profiles from ISO New England, so the New England power system where I live. Um, and we're not going to have storage in this example. I don't have any intertemporal constraints on ramping or flexibility either, so we assume we can turn down power plants at a moment's notice, et, et cetera. But this will capture the main dynamics at play. So this is what um, the system looks like if we require 20% of our energy to come from wind or solar and let the model pick the cheapest way to do that. This is the annual hourly load profile. You see you know, highest in the summer periods and the afternoons. We have some winter peaks when it gets really cold. Um, and then we have in yellow the output from solar throughout the year um, as it contributes 20% of the overall share. And I've added a number of dials here that we can keep track of as I add more and more clean energy in this example. The top shows the energy value of wind and solar. So the next megawatt hour of wind or solar, or next megawatt of wind or solar I deploy, uh, what's its value? 
uh, in terms of energy substitution. A value of 100% means that every megawatt hour it generates is going to displace a megawatt hour from our natural gas plant. We'll call that 100%. Okay? Um, and then I have capacity value here, which is to say for every 100 megawatts of wind or solar I deploy, the next 100 megawatts, how many megawatts of natural gas can I shut down and still have a reliable grid that meets our, our highest demand? And that's already quite low at 20% share from solar. Um, so it's 9% for wind, meaning I, I, for every 100 megawatts of wind, I can shut down 9 megawatts of natural gas. And it's 4% for solar. And then the final dial is overgeneration, which is the percentage of the, the amount of uh, the solar or wind deployed um, that's curtailed uh, or would have to be stored um, throughout the year. So now we have no overgeneration at 20% share. We can use all of it. Okay? So this is all great. Um, no value decline here yet, except for on the capacity side. Um, and it's a lot easier to look at this if we transform it into what's called the net load duration curve. So instead of ordering everything chronologically, we'll order it from the highest uh, peak demand period to the lowest demand period. And then we'll take out the chunk from wind and solar in this green and yellow bar. So we've lumped them both together now. And what you can see is that over here, we have 34 gigawatts as the highest demand in the year, and that summer, August, uh, or September 5th at 5 p.m. Um, and then the net peak here, um, actually, that, the net peak is at September 8th. I'm not exactly sure when the... The peak is, uh, is 33 gigawatts. So all of the solar, we've deployed enough solar to meet 20% of our energy needs. And we've reduced the firm capacity from gas needed only by 2 megawatts, or 2 gigawatts. Okay? Um, and then throughout the year, it contributes more and more. And we have this sort of fatter tail here on the end during the lower demand periods. All right. Now what happens when we increase the share of clean energy required to 40%? Well, the first thing to note is that we start getting a mix. Now we have 5% uh, of the mix comes from wind, even though solar is cheaper in a levelized cost basis, right? So solar has a lower cost, but the model's already starting to pick wind as a complement because the value of the solar starts to decline enough that it's more valuable on a net basis to add some solar to the mix, or some wind to the mix. Um, and that's because the energy substitution value from the solar has fallen by 23%. So that means that 23% of the energy generated by the next megawatt hour of solar I add to the grid is going to occur during these periods here when we've already dis displaced all of the natural gas. And we actually have overgeneration shown in blue here occurring. So adding another megawatt hour is just, uh, of, or megawatt of solar is going to cluster a bunch of its output here in these periods when we already have an abundance of solar output. And it's going to have less of it uh, produced here in the hours when we want to displace our natural gas plants. So the energy substitution value falls. The same is true for wind. It's fallen by less to uh, uh, 91%. And the net peak hasn't moved, so we have the same uh, capacity and, uh, and solar value. And now we're overgenerating enough energy to meet 3% of annual demand. So this blue wedge here, if we could capture and store all of it at some cost, could meet another 3% of our annual supply. All right, now let's go to 60%. Something interesting happens. The share of wind and solar flips. So now we're getting more of our energy from, from wind and less from solar, even though, as I mentioned at the beginning, the energy value or the levelized cost of the solar is cheaper than the wind. Uh, and that's because of the different timing of when the energy is produced. The solar energy value now has fallen to 59%, uh, and wind has now fallen to 72%. And something interesting happens, which is that the net peak moved to August 19th at 6 p.m. It's now later in the day, so solar output is lower, and it's apparently a high uh, pressure front period when uh, wind speeds are low. So now uh, the capacity value for wind and solar have both fallen to 2%, which means I have to add 100, gigawatts, uh, or 100 megawatts of wind or solar to displace just 2 megawatts of firm gas. And then you can see that the the, even though we're generating a lot more of our energy throughout the year here from wind and solar, you have this stubborn firm uh, capacity need here that is hardly decreased uh, that we have to meet with natural gas plants in this example. Now you go to 80%, and, so, and we start to see a nonlinear increase, rapid rise in the overgeneration that occurs. Most of the solar and wind production occurs at the same time. So as I add another 20 percentage points of wind and solar, a lot of it is clustered in this period. Um, and I'm not counting the overgeneration towards the limit, so I have to add a lot more just to get uh, the hours here um, that count towards my target. Uh, and so that drives up overgeneration. Now it's enough to meet 28% of annual demand. Um, and it's driven the energy value down to 20% and 25%, which means that 80% of the solar output I add from the next wind farm, solar farm occurs during these periods here in this half of the year when we already have overgeneration, and 75% of the output from the wind farm occurs in that period. Okay. In these examples so far, I've excluded the model from choosing nuclear. It was really expensive, so forget about it. We take it off the, uh, off the mix and say, let's just use the wind and solar. But what happens if we free up that constraint? Well, the surprising thing, or perhaps surprising thing, is that the model actually picks a good chunk uh, 
of nuclear to add to the mix, even though, as I mentioned, it's five times more expensive in terms of capacity uh, deployed than the solar farm or wind farm. In fact, about 15% or 10% of the mix now comes from uh, nuclear. The shares of, of wind and solar fall a little bit, and we see that the overgeneration is dramatically reduced, and the wind energy and solar energy substitution values have actually increased a bit in this more optimized mix. And that's because whereas we had to dump a bunch of solar and wind in, in periods when we already had too much to displace a, a little bit of natural gas over here when wind and solar outputs were lower, the, 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 coal, or the, sorry, the nuclear plants can basically displace the natural gas one for one. Add it to the mix, knock off the natural gas plants. So it has high capacity value and direct energy substitution value and therefore delivers a lot more value to this, energy, this carbon constrained clean energy mix uh, than another megawatt hour of wind or solar even though they have lower cost. All right? So this is a relatively simple model, as I mentioned, doesn't capture a lot of important complexities like the role of energy storage or demand flexibility or intertemporal ramping constraints, et cetera. And that's exactly what we do in a paper that we published in November in the journal Joule on the role of firm low carbon resources in uh, deep decarbonization of power generation. So we use a detailed electricity system capacity planning model that includes operating constraints that are important to this long-term planning problem, like how fast power plants can ramp up and down, the cost of turning on or off a, uh, or cycling a thermal power plant like a nuclear plant or a gas plant. And we include energy storage, demand flexibility, and a range of different technologies to try to understand how far we can go with wind, solar, and storage alone, uh, and what role other complementary firm low carbon resources play in a low carbon context. What we find is that there are basically three ingredients to a cost-effective low carbon energy mix. And they, uh, we offer a new taxonomy to capture these three ingredients. So the first are the role of things like wind and solar, um, but also run over hydro plants um, as fuel saving variable renewables. I call them fuel saving because as we saw in the last example, most of their value comes from energy substitution and not capacity. So they deliver the greatest value when they can generate at times when they're displacing the fuel consumption by a high marginal cost resource like a natural gas plant or a biogas plant um, or a coal plant. Uh, and so they deliver most of their value as fuel savers. Then I have a set of technologies which include demand response, which is reducing consumption when prices of electricity are very high. Flexible demand, which means things like electric vehicle charging that can be moved around in time to reduce our costs. Uh, and battery energy storage um, from lithium ion batteries or similar technologies, which we call fast burst resources because they are best suited to providing fast burst but not sustained output in the times that are most valuable to help balance out the system and provide the greatest capacity value in our mix. And finally, to complement these uh, resources, that, and these are fast burst because they're either energy constrained like a battery or have a very high opportunity cost like demand curtailment or demand response. Um, you, can, you know, can reduce your energy consumption a little bit, but reducing it a lot and over a sustained period of time incurs a significant cost. Um, so they're best for short output. So to complement these two things, variable weather dependent renewables and fast burst resources, we have a set of technologies we call firm low carbon resources. We call them firm because they can generate power at any time of the year. They can, they're not energy constrained, so they can produce energy for any length of time. Um, and they're not weather dependent, so their output is not variable in response to, to weather inputs like solar or wind or hydro. And there's a range of different options here, none of which are on track uh, today to contribute the role that we need in the long term. They include geothermal energy, nuclear power, gas or coal plants with carbon capture, solid biomass, biogas, and as we'll explore later, potentially long duration, very long duration energy storage technologies that might be able to substitute for these. So in our paper, what we did basically was take a wide range of future technology costs. You know, who knows how cheap solar is going to be, whether we'll ever be able to build another, natural, or another nuclear plant that isn't exorbitant in cost, um, whether natural gas with carbon capture will come to market soon or not, uh, how much biomass we have available. So we take a whole range of these uncertainties. We create 17 different technology cost combination scenarios with discrete combinations of a high or low cost for each of those technologies. Uh, and we model two different regions with very different weather. Uh, the, a northern system modeled after New England weather and climate patterns, and a southern system modeled after Texas climate patterns um, and solar and wind resource. And then we do a, basically a simple with and without analysis. Let's model one where we take only two of the ingredients. Um, so we have wind and solar as fuel savers. We have demand response uh, and, and energy storage and demand flexibility as fast burst. And then we have conventional natural gas plants as firm but not low carbon technologies in the mix versus uh, a with analysis where we include a set of firm low carbon options, nuclear, gas plants with CCS, biomass, and biogas in this analysis. So not all of the options, but a good chunk of them. Um, and what we see here, and this graph shows the results for the northern system, the range of costs across the core technology scenarios 
if we exclude firm low carbon resources or if we include them as we tighten the emissions limit down to zero. So these are denoted in grams per kilowatt hour. And for comparison, we have about uh, 500 grams per kilowatt hour as the average for the US. So this is a 60% reduction, 80%, 90%, 99, 99.9, .9, down to zero. Okay. And what we see is that as we pass about the 80% reduction mark, or 50 grams per kilowatt hour, which is about where France and Sweden are for their emissions rates now, uh, the costs start to rise rapidly in systems that depend only on wind, solar, and storage, largely due to the dynamics that I showed you in the previous simplified example. Whereas if we include a range of firm low carbon options, the, ex the, the costs are lower in every case by 10 to 65%, depending on the scenario. And as you see, the cost spread is lower, which is important given the technical uncertainty that we face. What this means is that the dependence of our scenarios on achieving cost declines for future technology is lower when we have more options. So this is a lower risk and lower co expected cost strategy than trying to um, decarbonize entirely with wind, solar, and batteries. This is the results for the southern system, which has better wind and solar profiles, so the results are a little closer, um, but very much the same. Okay? And this is true across nearly 1,000 different cases that span a wide range of technology costs, the two distinct regions I mentioned, and as well as sensitivity cases that include a large amount of flexible demand, uh, linking these two regions with uh, a big chunk of free transmission to balance out their variability, uh, adding longer duration storage technologies with 24 or 100 hour storage duration, and under these increasingly stringent CO2 limits. This is an example of what one of these systems might look like for a given week. This is the southern system at uh, one gram per kilowatt hour, so almost completely decarbonized in the peak week uh, throughout the year, the net peak. And you can see that we have a, a set of firm low carbon technologies here. It's nuclear playing a firm, uh, flexible base role. Uh, so we have some uh, ramping of the nuclear plants during the day when the solar output is highest. Um, then we have wind and solar here in green. And then all of our fast burst uh, resources, demand response, demand flexibility, and storage, shifting power around for a few hours throughout the day at the most valuable times. So this is different from the way the system runs today, but not wholly so. And it's a balanced mix uh, of different technologies. This is what it looks like when we exclude the firm resources. So the first thing to note is that the y-axis is doubled. So we now have these huge spikes in output from all the solar we have to dump into the system to meet our limits. Um, that solar output all occurs during the daytime hours. We have to store all of that in blue with a large amount of energy storage capacity. And even though we have a bunch of cheap storage in this example, it doesn't make sense to store all of it. So this cross-hatched area is the curtailment, the additional curtailment of, of solar in the mix. And we curtail enough in these examples to meet about a fifth to half of the annual energy consumption. So we're just wasting all of that energy, even with the energy storage that we could build in these examples. Um, and this is a wholly different system that we have, where every minute and every hour, the out energy supply output is varying. We have to try to balance that with a whole bunch of energy storage and demand side flexibility. So feasible technically, but challenging to operate and much more expensive as our results show. I liken it to ba this example to trying to play basketball with only point guards. Right? You can do it. You can play a game with five point guards on the team. You can probably score some points. Uh, but you're not going to win the game, uh, certainly not against a team that has all five star players on each of the right positions on the field. Right? And that's what we need here. We need to complete the clean energy team. Solar and wind are stars. They're going to be stars in our energy mix. So will, uh, so will battery energy storage. But they're not going to be able to win the game on their own. We need low carbon firm, uh, firm complements to these technologies to complete the clean energy team. So I'd argue that in the near term, wind, solar, and batteries, and some transition from natural gas to coal, or coal to natural gas, sorry, in regions that haven't completed that transition yet, is going to drive the vast bulk of emissions reductions, say, over the next decade. In the longer term, though, to fully decarbonize electricity, we require some kind of firm low carbon substitute for both natural gas plants and basically all of our existing nuclear fleet, which is going to retire over the 2050 to 2060 time frame, if not sooner. So this is a big lift, right? Nuclear provides one in five electrons in the US today. Natural gas provides about 35%. And if we displace a lot more coal with it, maybe up to half. Okay, so we have to find some way to knock those technologies off the mix in the and substitute for them with something that is firm and low carbon uh, and can complement the wind and solar we have. So how do we complete the low carbon team? Well, as I mentioned, there's a range of options. Uh, one, which is regionally specific, but is relevant in my region of New England, might be tapping into hydropower plants with very large reservoirs. I say very large because they have to be able to withstand seasonal droughts and variability and provide months worth of energy storage capacity in their, in their reservoirs. Places like Quebec or Sweden or France, uh, I mean, or, or Finland have this capability, but this is fairly localized. Uh, a more scalable option potentially globally would be nuclear reactors. 
Uh, anybody who's followed the news lately knows that our efforts to build new large-scale gigawatt, you know, 1,000 megawatt scale nuclear uh, plants in the U.S. and Europe have gone terribly with huge cost overruns and delays uh, and difficulty managing these complex large-scale construction and engineering projects. So some companies like NuScale, whose device is pictured here, are pursuing much smaller nuclear reactors. This is a 60 megawatt nuclear power facility. Uh, it's small enough to fit on the back of a truck or on a barge down a river to be shipped, to be manufactured in a facility um, in a controlled environment and shipped to the, the, the nuclear plants to be um, uh, deployed. Uh, and they would be deployed in, in packs of 6 or 12 or 18 uh, to, to equal uh, larger sizes of, of capacity. They're working their way right now through the NRC process, as are several other companies, um, but these are a long way from commercial readiness. So there's a challenge here to push them over the limit or over the line. Enhanced geothermal energy is another early stage technology that um, is in demonstration stage pre-commercial that could open up a wide range of opportunities for low carbon firm generation from a reliable uh, baseload source across mostly the Western United States, although even pockets uh, elsewhere. And this basically harnesses our, our um, uh, techniques that have been developed for uh, shale gas uh, and oil extraction for horizontal drilling and multi-stage fracturing to stimulate hydrothermal reservoirs and uh, enhance their capacity to produce geothermal energy in a much wider range of the country than is currently possible today. Carbon capture and storage is another option. This uh, shows the net power demonstration facility, which is outside of Houston and is currently going through commissioning. This is a small 50 megawatt thermal demonstration of a new alum cycle, supercritical CO2 uh, working fluid um, cycle that could produce zero emissions natural gas fired power. So no air pollution, no carbon dioxide emissions. All of it can be captured at high pressure and sequestered underground um, in saline aquifers or depleted oil wells. So if this works, we have a way to harness natural gas without contributing to uh, climate change as long as we can find a cost-effective way to store that CO2. As I mentioned, batteries are no substitute for firm resources. They play a complementary role as fast burst technologies, which is important. So you'll probably hear often that cheap energy storage is the holy grail for renewables integration. And that once we have cheap batteries, which we appear to have soon, we have solved the integration challenges. Well, that's true within a daytime period, right? If you want to shift solar energy a few hours from you know, 2 p.m. into the evening hours when peak demand is highest, great. Lithium ion batteries are awesome for that, and they're being deployed more and more at hundreds of megawatt scale uh, at utility scale solar and wind farms and elsewhere to provide that role. And in my modeling, they show up doing that all the time. But what we would need to truly displace firm generation is a wholly different animal. And it's a real open question, what I'm wor working on now with colleagues at MIT, to understand what the cost levels uh, for charging and discharging and energy capacity, the efficiencies, uh, the, cycle, or the, the cycle degradation or self-discharge rates, and the asset life of this technology would have to look like to truly act as a substitute for firm generators. So we have a research project underway to look at this now using similar modeling to basically back out the design space for uh, what firm generation or firm storage might look like to truly displace firm uh, low carbon generation in the, in the zero carbon mix. Um, what if we instead try to push renewables to the limits? I'm just going to briefly summarize. In a lit review that we've also published in Juul in December, we looked at uh, 40 different studies for deep decarbonization of the grid that others have published. And we looked at the common elements in the scenarios that rely wholly or, or primarily on wind and solar with those that rely on, um, on uh, uh, a more balanced mix. And what we see in the scenarios that lean into the wind and solar route is they have a set of common features. One is that they all include continent-scale transmission expansion. So if we want to rely heavily on weather-dependent renewables, um, A, it's good to be able to tap into the highest quality wind and solar resources so that, uh, for example, New England can uh, tap into solar resources from North Carolina or wind from Iowa um, rather than, or, or here we can, uh, in Texas, we can tap into wind and solar in West Texas rather than have to rely on things that are local next to the existing transmission grid. And we want to be able to smooth out the variability of these resources across the country so that if it's not windy in one place, it is in another place, and we can move power around to uh, smooth out their variability. And what we find in the models is that this is a very cost-effective solution if we could build the transmission. But many of them require roughly doubling the U.S. high-voltage transmission grid, even to get to, uh, in the NREL Renewable Future Study, an 80 or 90 percent renewable share total. Only about 50 percentage points of that is wind and solar. Um, we would need to double the U.S. high voltage transmission grid. So this would be a huge infrastructure challenge, one that is cost effective, but challenging from a siting and, uh, and, and cost allocation perspective. The other is they all include a large amount of, of demand flexibility, much more than you need in scenarios where your generation is more dispatchable and reliable, to move around supply or demand to match variability in supply rather than match uh, variability in demand with supply as we do today. 
Uh, and they usually include a large amount of energy efficiency to make the problem a lot easier. So if you assume away half of the energy demand, then it's a lot easier to do this. And there are real questions about the real world performance of energy efficiency programs. Many of them make a ton of sense. They make financial sense, but they're much more difficult to implement to solve a number of uh, non-pricing related market failures that prevent us from uptake of energy efficiency investments um, than they might appear in some engineering model that, that we run. The third are that we need wind, solar, and batteries to get even cheaper than we would in other scenarios. And this is because of the very low marginal value that they face in the scenarios where we push them to the limits. If we keep them in a more moderate role, we don't need such severe cost reductions for wind and solar and batteries to contribute to the portfolio. But if you want them to play the dominant role and push them really far beyond their ideal role on the team, you need even deeper cost reductions to occur without, to, to mitigate those um, increases in cost. You can see that in the spread of costs I showed you from our results where the lowest uh, range costs were the ones where we assumed the deepest reductions in, in solar and wind, and the costs are much more sensitive to those, uh, uh, the cost of the system are much more sensitive to the cost of uh, cost reductions for wind and solar and batteries in the scenarios that rely heavily on them. And you need generally some kind of seasonal or firm energy storage source. So you might have, uh, some of these studies assume huge amounts of underground thermal energy storage under every building in the country, or you can dump heat into the ground whenever we have excess energy, pull it back out to run uh, industrial processes or heat our buildings or cool our buildings. Um, others assume we have huge hydrogen energy uh, infrastructure across the, co uh, the economy, so we can produce excess hydrogen and store it in salt caverns um, or other infrastructure and then use it whenever we need it. So they have some kind of firm storage technology to, to um, complement the, the wind and solar. All of those technologies are nascent or co are too costly to deploy at the scale imagined in these studies, so it would require breakthroughs in their, their cost and performance. So let's, take a th let's think a little bit about the odds of these two strategies, okay? Let's assume that, you know, we, that since these technologies, since the wind and solar route is what has its, the, you know, sort of the, the trends going in its favor, and no one would bet today uh, that we're going to build a cost-effective nuclear facility, for example. Let's assume that we have a five and six odds that we can do all the things we need to do, or each of the things we need to do to um, get to the wind and solar-driven future. Right? So we roll a dice. As long as we don't come up with a one, we're good to go. Okay? Um, for continent-scale transmission, highly flexible demand and efficiency, even lower cost wind and solar and batteries, uh, and our, our firm seasonal storage option. And let's be pessimistic about these other technologies and say we only have a 50-50 shot at developing an affordable nuclear technology, then bringing it to market in time to count, developing affordable CCS, finding a sustainable way to harvest biomass that doesn't exacerbate other ecological concerns or land use uh, concerns, or developing engineered ge geothermal technology that can be scaled across the country. All right? Now, the challenge is that if we want to pursue the renewables-driven route, we need all of those things to happen, right? This is a joint probability. We need all four of them in some measurable degree to be ready to go when we need them. Whereas in this other option, as we see in our study, really you just need one firm low-carbon technology to complete the team. And the model picks different ones depending on what we assume about future technology costs. So nuclear is expensive and ga net gas with CCS is cheaper, fine, we'll go with gas with CCS. If biomass is available at scale, we'll go with biomass. So these are uh, alternatives to one another. They're substitutes. And if we remember our introductory st statistics and probability courses, when you take a, a set of things that all have a, one in, uh, a five and six chance of success, you multiply their joint probability, and they turn immediately into no better than a coin flip odds. Whereas each of our individual coin flips, as long as we can flip our coin four times, the odds of getting at least one of those to come up is about 94%. All right, these are totally made up hypothetical odds. Feel free to put your own in for any of these things. Check your own priors. Uh, the, the power of joint probability versus alternative here, uh, substitution, is quite powerful. And I think it offers an important framing to think about how we pursue this challenge of deep decarbonization, a challenge that I argue we cannot fail at, given the planetary stakes. So the best strategy, of course, would be to do all of the above, right? Keep pushing wind and solar and all of their complementary technologies forward as we try to develop and improve the low carbon firm options available as well. And if we add that additional coin flip, now we're up to 97% chances, and I'll take those odds. All right, let's close by talking about the Green New Deal. Uh, this is a, uh, the construction of the Hoover Dam um, as part of the, the, the new New Deal, the original New Deal. Um, so uh, if you've been following the news lately, you've probably uh, heard the buzz about a proposal for a Green New Deal that really is catapulted into the public consciousness, thanks largely to the people in this picture. Okay? This is the student activist of the Sunrise Movement, 
who staged a sit-in in December right after the elections um, in Speaker Pelosi, or well, not then Speaker Pelosi, but soon to be Speaker Pelosi's offices. Um, and newly elected Representative uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez from New York attended those sit-ins, and given the public uh, media buzz she had around her, uh, threw all of this discussion into the spotlight um, and uh, started everybody talking about this proposal from uh, the students and, and other allied um, uh, activists and think tanks for something called the Green New Deal. What was that? Uh, what is this Green New Deal you speak of? Um, so that was the main question initially, uh, and we got an answer for that um, just last week or the week before last, when um, Ocasio-Cortez with Senator Markey from Massachusetts and a number of co-sponsors, about 60 in the House and a dozen in the Senate, introduced a, a non-binding resolution, so it's not legislation, it's a resolution that outlines what uh, the principles and goals of a Green New Deal would be um, and how, um, uh, how we should go about accomplishing them. And what it basically calls for uh, is a 10-year national scale mobilization of the kind, quote, we haven't seen since the, the, the original New Deal or World War II to transform our economy, to pay powered on low carbon sources and to get to a net zero carbon economy. Um, depending on how you read the language and whose FAQ you read, that could either mean we have to complete the transition in 10 years or that we have a 10-year mobilization that puts us on track for that. Um, it also includes a whole number of goals about uh, social justice and um, ensuring that the, energy, the, um, the impacts of our energy system, which are concentrated in certain communities today, and the impact of our transition to low carbon, which will potentially leave certain communities behind, are addressed in an equitable and fair way, or just way. And it includes a number of goals around economic security, arguing that both the, uh, the opportunity to invest in clean energy at this scale will create opportunities for economic opportunity for people and growth, uh, and that we should be making sure that the economy as a whole offers us the kind of economic security that we need uh, to thrive in a low carbon future. So I just want to comment a little bit on some of the nuances of these, uh, of these goals and depending on how you interpret them. And the things that my research points to, to uh, being important components of any national mobilization to confront climate um, and the things that I would argue that some interpretations of the Green New Deal include uh, that we should uh, probably move past. Okay? So the first is that we definitely need to be targeting, as I said, a net zero carbon economy. If we want to get to global climate stabilization, the U.S. needs to lead and it needs to get to zero itself. Um, arguably sometime around 2050, um, I argue, is a, is a good uh, time frame uh, consistent with the two degrees Celsius goals, even with a reach with future net uh, emissions reductions with the, the 1.5C goals. And of that 30-year timeline gives us time to turn over a lot of the long-lived energy infrastructure that we have and uh, repurpose the investments we would make to replace that aging infrastructure in a cleaner direction without having to increase uh, dramatically the overall expenditures we, we make into the energy sector. If you try to do this by 2030, however, you have to do a bunch of things to rapidly accelerate the turnover of infrastructure. So that would mean banning sales of new fossil fuel cars effective yesterday. Uh, the average car stays on the road for 15 to 18 years or so. So the turnover time in that decade just to get all of the cars, even if you started selling 100% new zero emissions vehicles tomorrow, that wouldn't turn over the whole fleet in 10 years to be 100% clean. So we need to start doing scrappage programs, things like that. Power plants last 30 to 50 to 60 years. We need to shut all of those down regardless of where they are in their asset life. Um, we need to dramatically expand the grid to accommodate all of this. We have to uh, rebuild um, households uh, or houses to be more efficient as the, the plan calls for. So a lot of infrastructure investment that have to be compressed to a very short time frame. And that's going to increase the share of our economic activity that has to go there. Um, and it would be similar to a World War II or Green New Deal style mobilization, taking a substantial fraction of GDP, which would take away from other activities that we might use that money for. And if we manage this transition over a longer time frame, um, the, that share of overall economic activity we have to devote to the challenge is much reduced and we can take advantage of much more natural capital stock turnover. Second, um, I argue as the, legislation, the text of the resolution says that we should be focused on 100% renewable and other carbon-free resources to achieve our goal. It may be that firm renewable resources are uh, available to uh, play the role we need them to complement wind and solar, but it may be that we need to lean into nuclear or natural gas with CCS to complete the job. And I argue, given the planetary stakes, that we should have some role for those technologies to contribute, given that they offer a dramatic reduction overall in air pollution and CO2 emissions um, to help contribute to the challenge. Whereas some uh, argue that, including an FAQ that was released by Ocasio-Cortez's office and then taken down, that no, this means only 100% renewables and excludes things like biomass and nuclear and CCS um, as per the demands of the environmental organizations I talked about earlier. I argue that a 10-year aggressive near-term mobilization is the right way to respond to this challenge. We can't wait 
till 2050. We have to address it urgently now. But I argue that that is a, a mobilization that should put us on a path to zero carbon by 2050, not complete the transition in 10 years, for the reasons I talked about before. And one thing that's largely missing from the current discussion is that we also need a major expansion of R&D, research development and demonstration funding, to expand and improve the low carbon options available, particularly to complete the clean energy team. So nuclear, CCS, uh, long duration energy storage, enhanced geothermal, uh, and cleaner, uh, more sustainable biomass options. Um, if instead we focus on a transition within a 10 year time frame, that really doesn't leave a lot of time for R&D to help you. So you have to be able to, to complete the job with the technologies that we have on the shelf today, um, and that really leaves no role for R&D. &D. Um, and I think that that's a mistake uh, given the challenges that we would face um, with the off-the-shelf technologies available now. Areas where we agree, um, I agree with the, the advocates of the Green New Deal, is that we should be linking this climate mobilization to economic renewal opportunities and economic justice goals. Climate change is an important challenge and it's beginning to affect all of us today. We can see that around us with wildfires and droughts and coastal flooding. But still, addressing climate change is largely about other people. It's about how we help future generations, how we help the most vulnerable populations elsewhere in the world. And I think that if we're going to see the American population rise to this challenge and invest the assets and the resources we need, there has to be something in it for us. There's a what about me kind of element to this. Um, and, I'm, and I think that's fair, it's rational to ask that question, what about me? Am I sacrificing for others or am I getting something out of this? And the smart thing, the, the really powerful potential political appeal of the Green New Deal is that it answers that what about me question. It says, what's in it for you is economic renewal and opportunity. Millions of new jobs in growing energy sectors, um, repurposing our infrastructure, better public transit, better livable walkable cities and communities, um, and, and reduced air pollution, reduced environmental contamination, a variety of things that are tangible and real and benefit every American. Okay? And the second is that we should be willing to harness all of the public, tools, public policy tools at our disposal, including public, direct public investment, government extended finance for certain activities, sectoral standards and regulations, and a role for carbon pricing, um, but not solely carbon pricing, as some would argue. Um, and so we need to be able to think about each of the challenges that we face in the policy transition, think about the instruments that are best suited to ch tackle that challenge, uh, and not argue that a single instrument like a carbon price, for example, uh, or a Clean Air Act regulation could accomplish these goals solely on their own. The final th uh, point I'll make in closing is that we have to think not just about the United States, but about the global challenge, right? The challenge is to eliminate global emissions. If we were to snap our fingers and wipe out US emissions tomorrow, we would not have solved global warming, right? We're only about 20% of global emissions in the US. So what we need to do is find a way to power economic development and expansion across the world with low carbon resources to zero out global CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions. And I argue that that, are, that means the US needs to focus its policies in ways that make clean energy cheap for the world. Not necessarily deploy things in a way, at, at a cost that the U.S. can afford, but to deploy things at a cost uh, that eventually drives down the cost of those technologies to a cost that Africa and India um, and uh, Southeast Asia can afford, where the vast majority of the energy demand growth is expected to come. This uh, image from the IA shows the current world at night in Africa, where 600 million people in sub-Saharan Africa lack any access to electricity alone, and where over a billion people live on the continent. And this is what the map might look like if we were to power Africa and to expand uh, electricity access to levels even not even quite what we would uh, experience here in the United States, but to somewhat modern levels where people have access to clean electricity, to cook, to, uh, to read by, to power industry and economic activity. And so if we can't achieve this goal, if we can't power human development in a way that doesn't exacerbate the climate challenge, I think we'll fail ultimately in confronting climate change. And so whatever the US does, we need to deploy our innovation, our capital and our policies in a way that make clean energy cheap for the world and drive down their cost over the time that we're transitioning to a low carbon grid. Thank you. Uh, raise your hand if you have a question. I'll, I'll start with one. So uh, you had me at banana versus hamburger. So uh, <laughs> good job there. So I know it's risky at this time of day. Everybody's hungry yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll quote, uh, you know, uh, Professor Al Bart, who was a physics professor at University of Colorado was famous for making a, a lecture on exponential growth, and he says, uh, the greatest shortcoming of human race is our inability to understand the exponential function, like humans aren't. So you're, you're essentially saying, well, we also can't understand how to add uh, a bunch of nonlinear curves together of wind and solar output. So is it, uh, is it uh, how, you, you obviously spend a lot of time trying to communicate with policy folks or people 
trying to make policy, whether they're a policy folk or not, <laughs> uh, do they need to understand some of these nonlinear effects or not? Do we need more engineers uh, or scientists that are involved in policy making? Or per your, uh, your, your slide in comparison to the Green New Deal, at least at this stage, you would pretty much tell them, hey, pretty much do what you're asking, which is try to install a bunch of solar, wind and solar and hopefully some other things, but we're not at these high penetration levels yet. So yeah. they don't see, it's hard for them to see what you're discussing because you're talking about getting to zero and they're like, well, I'm trying to get from 500 to 400 right yeah. now. And so th do they understand that or do they just not care? Yeah, uh, so I, I think that, you know, it obviously differs who you're talking to. And I think a lot of policymakers ha I've have talked to do understand this challenge, the idea that, we need more than a few technologies to complete the mix uh, is intuitive. I mean, together, coal and natural gas supply only about 70, 75% of our energy mix. So the idea that we could push wind and solar to be as big as coal and natural gas and still have a big chunk to go, you know, is pretty intuitive, like the, especially if we're going to be doubling the size of our electricity system to decarbonize the rest of the economy. Sure, wind and solar have a long way to go. This is not about bad-mathing wind and solar and saying we don't want more of it. We want a lot more of it. But we don't want only wind and solar. We need a set of other complementary technologies. And I think that that is fairly intuitive. Um, and we actually are seeing early stages of some of these effects that you can point to to give people examples. So we are seeing the daytime energy market price in, in California, for example, collapse. And we have hours when the real-time prices are zero or negative. And there's so much solar that people are trying to figure out how to get rid of it, um, to export it to other regions, to store it, to do something useful with it. Um, and so there are other places in the world, uh, in the Midwest, where that's happening with wind power in certain hours at night. And nuclear power plants are trying to figure out how to operate more flexibly so they can ramp down their output when that happens, because otherwise they're eating negative prices. The prices go negative and they have to pay to stay operating. So the early stages of these kinds of effects are starting to be seen. Policymakers, and particular regulators and market participants in the electricity space are becoming aware of them. And I think that they're a good wake up call for the challenges ahead and start to communicate some of these things in a tangible way. Um, yeah, so um, you, you're talking about um, uh, energy storage needing to be ultra cheap and long duration. How long is long duration and how cheap is ultra cheap? Yeah, well, that's exactly what the paper we're working on right now is going to hopefully answer in another month or so. Um, but I can give you a, a rough idea. So uh, lithium ion batteries at large scale cost probably around $350 per kilowatt hour to install today. That's down a lot from just a year ago. Um, and uh, in our models, we model them all the way down to about $100 per kilowatt hour. We also did sensitivity cases where we included um, a longer duration storage technology that could be 24 or 100 hour energy to power ratio. So if you're you know, running at full power, you discharge in 24 or 100 hours. Um, and we modeled that down to about $70 per kilowatt hour. And that was not sufficient to, uh, to tackle, the, to displace the firm low carbon options. It made everybody in the system more efficient by running more often, but it didn't reduce the need for the firm generators. So what we're starting to see in our preliminary results are really order of magnitude cheaper numbers even than that. So instead of $350 for lithium ion today or $70 for this low carbon technology we assumed in the, in the study, maybe more like a few dollars per kilowatt hour. Um, and then there's the how much does it cost per kilowatt to both charge and discharge, which is often asymmetrical for these technologies. Um, so you think about a compressed air energy storage technology, it's different to charge and then discharge. Um, hydrogen, you have an you know, electrolysis machine to charge and a gas turbine or fuel cell to discharge. So, um, so we're looking at the interactions of all those variables and trying to come up with a combination of charge cost and efficiency, uh, energy cost, discharge cost and efficiency, asset life, uh, and self-discharge rate that gives you, so it's seven parameters that give you a viable substitute. And there'll be some combination of those. You know, higher efficiency means you can have a low, uh, higher cost per kilowatt hour of storage capacity and vice versa. Um, and so there's an interaction between all of those that we're looking at. But we're really talking about a few dollars to maybe 10-ish, 10 to 15, 20 dollars per kilowatt hour. Um, and if you want to do that, you need pretty high efficiencies. Um, so these are really big lifts. They're not uh, out, of, out of the question for some technologies to get there. Compressed air energy storage in huge salt caverns or hydrogen storage underground in salt caverns could be that cheap. Um, some thermal st storage technology options could as well. but they all tend to have very low efficiencies, and so it, it's not clear that you can get the combination of all seven attributes that we need. So our hope for the paper is to identify a set of R&D priorities that, that agencies like RPE and the Department of Energy can focus on, and researchers at places like UT can focus on to help expand the options that we have available. A yeah. couple of questions. I wanted to ask your uh, uh, ideas on what's needed in the nuclear and uh, CCS space, because it seems like uh, convincing environmentalists on that score is going to be especially challenging. And then Emery Lovins was here earlier this week, and you've kind of maybe 
referenced uh, some answers, but his sort of techno optimism always strikes me as uh, both entertaining and I'd like to believe it, but I have this nagging suspicion that something's not right and that the, the, the sort of efficiency revolution is just around the corner and it doesn't quite arrive yet. Yet we're seeing electric vehicles and other things that he's been talking about as the harbinger of the future for that are now finally emerging. So I wonder what your take is on his. Yeah, his it's a, that's a great question. And um, I thought about titling this paper The Hard Path as a kind of a, um, a reference to Amory's soft energy pass, which you know back in the 70s argued the same thing I'm talking about here, which is that we can do it all with wind, solar, and efficiency. You didn't even think about batteries at that point. Um, and it was largely an argument against building out new nuclear capacity um, at that point. So it wasn't a climate policy. It was a, it was a different uh, vision. Um, but a lot of the same ethos that is, has motivated a lot of environmental activism through to this day. And it, it really is the same case. Now, what's changed is that wind and solar are a lot cheaper than they were then. And so they can play a lot bigger role than I think it was conceivable in the 70s. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, like you said, we've been talking about the energy efficiency revolution since that day, too. And we do make measurable progress every year on energy efficiency, but not the kinds of uh, factor 10 improvements that Amory likes to, to argue are waiting for us as we're willing to pick up the dollar bills on the, on the floor. Um, I think when you deal, drill, drill into the challenges that prevent the, what seem to be cost-effective energy efficiency upgrades, you see a variety of things that really do have costs to overcome. So you, know, you need to um, have the skilled uh, you know, energy managers that can take care of these things. You need to ha um, not just offer a return that is, um, that is attractive in some generic sense, but it is better than the other things that a company could do with that same dollar, like invest in their core business and expanding their market share, for example. Um, so if you're Apple, you know, you're not going to take a 3% you know, or 5% return on an efficiency upgrade if you can dump that money into expanding your, your core product and making a 25% return. Um, so there's a lot of these sort of principal agent challenges for renters and homeowners. Uh, um, energy efficiency programs that try to implement those ha or that overcome those challenges have big implementation costs to go out and knock on doors and convince people to do this. Um, so there are a whole bunch of hidden costs that, that start to surface when you dig into those. And I think limit the pool of available you know, below cost energy efficiency. And the other thing that I've debated with Amory about over the years is the magnitude of rebound effects where if you do truly deliver a lower cost energy, uh, energy efficiency upgrade where you're lowering the overall cost of an energy service, well, economics would argue that when you lower the cost of a service, people consume more of it. Now, there's a certain saturation level you might get, at, get to for, say, you know, how many miles you want to drive in your car. You're not necessarily going to drive more just because it's cheaper to drive, although in many cases that's true. The cheaper it gets to commute, people are willing to live further from, from home. Um, uh, and you're not going to light your house so much more just because you have cheaper LEDs. But to a certain extent, that's what we do. We light more spaces uh, and exterior spaces every year as lighting gets cheaper. So there's this take up um, uh, of some of the energy efficiency gains, it, not to reduce energy consumption, but to increase energy service provision. That's good from an economic welfare perspective, particularly in places like Africa, where what we desperately need is more energy consumption, uh, or more services at least. Um, but it doesn't contribute then to reduce CO2 emissions. And so I th think there's a limited role, an important but limited role for efficiency that is a lot lower than what Amory would argue. And as I said, if you assume that efficiency delivers half of the problem, the other half gets a lot easier to solve. And so I think we're, we need to be realistic about the scale of the supply challenge that we have to decarbonize. Um, as far as nuclear, I mean, I am not the world expert on uh, the ch you know, what to do to overcome the challenges in the nuclear sector. I like to hang out with some of them and learn from them. But what I understand is that you know, for the US, I think it's going to be very unlikely that unless we're willing to commit to build, say, 100 new plants and have a sustained program of investment in a few designs, that we're ever going to do the sort of large scale gigawatt you know, size nuclear plants that we've built in the past. I think that the smaller modular reactors offer a better solution for the West, where um, you know, we do know how to ma do advanced manufacturing still. We don't know how to do large-scale civil engineering projects on time and on budget. Those are exceedingly rare in any sector, not just nuclear. Um, and so add on to that an uh, atrophied nuclear supply chain, and you've got, I think, a real, real challenge to overcome, unless you're really willing to set a commit to, we're just going to build 100 of these. So if the Green New Deal really pursued nuclear construction the way that we built dams and nuclear plants, by the way, in TVA um, in the past, then maybe we could do this again. But unless we're willing to do that, I think we have to rely on technological innovation to lower some of the barriers to construction. My understanding is that Germany has spent about 10% of their GDP on the total set of renewable resources. Setting aside the Green New Deal, in terms of the cost of what you're proposing, what is the total cost of that to the GDP if we adopted all of these things? Uh, I don't know if I have a 
crisp answer to that question yet. I mean, in terms of electricity decarbonization, just in terms of the, the cost per kilowatt hour of the energy supply in some of our scenarios. If you assume continued technological progress along a range of technologies, we could be talking about the cost of energy supply increasing from maybe 50 or $55 per megawatt hour, or five and a half cents per kilowatt hour to 70 or 80 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, that's higher than our current wholesale rates, especially around here, where we have a lot of old infrastructure that was already amortized or even wiped out in bankruptcies, and so we're just covering the ongoing costs of those things. So wholesale prices are more like $35 or $45 now. So this would be an increase, maybe say double of our, our electricity supply cost, which itself is only about half of your total cost of your electricity. Um, so, you know, it's not a small cost, but it's one that I think wouldn't, wouldn't be an inordinate share of, of U.S. GDP. Um, now, that's just electricity. Um, and there's a bunch of other components if we want to pursue something like a Green New Deal across all sectors um, that I'm not sure I have the, the precise costs on. As I said in the example about the timeline, the reason that I think pursuing this timeline over a 30-year period is advantageous is we already invest, uh, I think, what, 4% of our GDP or somewhere on that magnitude in the energy sector every year. And the more we can repurpose that money to replace oil and gas and, and emitting infrastructure with, um, with low carbon infrastructure over time, uh, we don't have to spend more to do that. We just have to spend it in different ways. And so finding public policy incentives that can repurpose where that flow of capital goes, um, that trillions of dollars we're already going to invest over the next 30 years uh, into low carbon technologies would reduce the overall cost of the transition. Um, and so I think that's a really key piece of the puzzle to think about is how do we leverage policy to transform where the, public, the private sector dollars are going to go anyway uh, to areas that we want to, um, we want to uh, pursue to, uh, to transition to a clean energy economy. I will take one more, maybe two more questions. That's, that's it. Thanks. Hi. Um, I had some questions regarding the other half of that electric bill, namely the transmission piece. Um, you stated that we would need to double our transmission, and I'm curious if this is in a megawatt capacity sense or a physical distance sense. Um, yeah. Partly because, too, we're already dealing with, ma with issues of massive transmission grids and east to west, north to south constraints and a lot of RTOs and ISOs with high wind pe penetration. Yep. Yeah, so in the high renewable scenarios, um, the, so the renewables future study uh, calls for a doubling of the megawatt miles, so both, <laughs> both units. Um, so you, know, you build higher, higher uh, voltage and you don't need as much physical infrastructure, um, they, but that's how they did it. It was a megawatt miles instead of um, megawatts or miles. Um, yeah, and so I think they talked about it somewhere between 135 to 200 million megawatt miles, and we have about 160 or 180 million megawatt miles of high voltage grid today. So it's about double. And again, that's for about 50% renewable. So you might need that even in some of the scenarios I talk about with firm low carbon. Um, but if you wanted to double that share and go to a 90 or 100% wind and solar, you probably need you know, that much more transmission as well. Um, now, transmission itself is only maybe 5 or 10% of your bill. So even if you doubled that, it wouldn't be a huge part. But distribution is a whole other chunk. Um, and that really depends on how efficiently we integrate things like electric vehicles um, and the electrification of heating so that we're not dramatically increasing the peak demand on the distribution system. So there, all these pieces have to go together and have to be done in a way that is as efficient as possible to use all this infrastructure and capital investment we have to make in the most um, high utilization manner we can, I think, in order to keep these costs down. So a lot of oil and gas companies have started to adopt um, kind of solar energy and wind energy. And I was kind of curious your thoughts into like how can they, how can they be contributing more to the decarbonization movement? Mm -hmm. And what is their play for all the assets they've purchased? Would it be to take it as a lost cost and just drop it? Or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, this is in many ways the biggest challenge, right, is you've got a huge amount of wealth generated and a huge amount of capital invested in a sector that has to fundamentally transform if we're going to tackle this challenge. And I would say that for my view is that the best way that oil and gas companies can contribute to that transition is to by identifying the areas where their existing uh, skill set and comparative advantage is useful in a low carbon context. You know, deploying solar or wind probably isn't it. There's a lot of people that can build solar and wind farms. And you know, I don't know that Exxon or BP or, or, solar or, or, or um, Shell has any particular advantage. Now, they've done it just fine in a lot of places, but um, 
you know, the, so more of that is fine, but I think the areas where they really can contribute are areas that are adjacent to their core capabilities. And that could be uh, carbon capture and storage, so the pipeline infrastructure, the well field management, and the injection that would need to happen to do that at scale. If we want to have CCS be a substantial contributor to global decarbonization, we're going to have to build as much infrastructure as the whole oil and gas sector today. So it's a huge lift. Um, whether, you know, we can do that and make any money doing it is a big question that policy has to solve. But um, uh, pursuing um, low carbon fuels like hydrogen or ammonia, um, where they're really good at producing hydrocarbons, we're going to produce different types of, um, of chemicals uh, and manage those and transport them and, and, and use them. Uh, enhanced geothermal energy where technology, you know, companies that are good at horizontal drilling and fracturing and shale need to figure out how to do those things in basalt formations and others that are, that are home to geothermal reservoirs and you know, adopt that technology there. So there's a lot of adjacent opportunities floating offshore wind turbines, so like Statoil or now Equinor is the world leader in doing floating offshore wind because they're really good at building floating platforms for oil and gas. So there's a lot of things there, those, those knowledge, the knowledge and engineering capability and skill set that oil and gas companies have can be applied in a low carbon context probably won't be necessarily at the same return on investment as they're getting from their current core business, though. And so unless policy sends a really clear signal about where they're going to go and the, where they have to go in the future, I don't anticipate them to do this out of the goodness of their heart. These are companies, right? And they're going to follow the, um, the business opportunities that are there. And so the challenge is to use public policy to reshape those business opportunities. And if they do, I think they can be huge contributors to this challenge because there's an enormous amount of technical and engineering uh, and business innovation knowledge within those companies. Okay, thank you very much. Give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank Jesse. you very much. Thanks.